glad to have you join us on this edition of the show. Our guest today is a founder who talks more about her experience trying to build a startup. We have other news and updates lined up, so let's kick off the show. I am Chukameka Agbata, and this is Tech Trends. Good, bad, or indifferent. If you are not investing in new technology, you're going to be left behind. Coding has become an essential skill for young people who want to become programmers, but without owning or having access to a laptop, it might seem an impossible task. In this small office in Yaba, no PCs are allowed, but they are learning to code. The only laptop visible is the one used in transitioning from a mobile. So we'll be considering some um, basic HTML and PHP uh, tags. Samuel Anyele, known as a mobile prof, is teaching young people how to code, but without a personal computer. He does this using Android smartphones. Thankfully, the uh, Android phone is based on or is built on top of a Linux kernel, and then there is an emulator that you can use to mimic the Linux environment. So you can teach students how to be efficient programmers, even though they are not, um, they do not have a laptop. Um, unfortunately. For most of the world, they have access to PCs, but in Nigeria, we have very low PC penetration. Most of the people who are excited about tech literally do not have access to a laptop. So we are coming from the, their perspective, with the tools they have, and enabling them based on the tools they have. Teaching them things that, by the time they learn how to code on the phone, trans transiting to a laptop is very easy. All they have to do is to load a Linux on the laptop, and all the knowledge they acquired on the phone immediately translated to working on a laptop. Although working on the mobile is easier, it does get to a point when the coder has to transition to a personal computer. Samuel tells us more. The challenge usually is when you, when you are dealing with a lot of um, uh, coding lines on the mobile phone. That is a challenge on the back-end development. Apart from that, there is no more challenge transiting from the mobile to the laptop. If you, are doing, if you are doing microservices and you're able to break down your code into smaller chunks, the mobile phone can handle any complexity of application as far as it's a back-end development. Now for front-end development, that's a totally different story because the uh, mobile browsers have not matured to the point where they can debug very well. So you, if you are doing anything interface development, anything UI, UX, you are forced to go back to your, your system because those are the, they, are, they are the browsers that are mature enough to handle interface um, better and debugging better. So I'm currently on my laptop, I've made some changes to um, an application on my laptop and so I, want to, I would like to um, push it to my um, Mac because I want to work on my Mac now. Uh, so what I need to do is to use Git. Git allows me to do a Git add to add the changes I've made. Git add dot would allow me to add the changes I've made. And then after adding the changes, I do git commit to commit those changes to my repo. Git commit, I put a message for the commits. So I say um, latest files. While coding on smartphones is not exactly a new concept, a number of software developers aren't happy with the experience. But Samuel says it is an advantage for those that can't afford a computer, especially in Africa. It has been in existence, uh, but the challenge is that for a lot of people, it's, um, it, it's like a, it's something that uh, was packaged from outside for us, for mobile for, um, for development. Development generally is packaged from outside. So a lot of the people who are looking at programming already, okay, from the West, they already have laptops. Um, they don't have a lack of laptops in the, in, in, in the West. They are, so uh, most of the things they are doing, most of the tutorials they are creating, uh, they believe that if you want to code, you need to do a laptop. The reality for us in Africa is that we literally do not have these devices. So we have to be creative about how we adopt and use the technologies we want to use. Yes, we want to be part of the technology age, but if we do not use the existing devices, that we have to be part of that technology age, that technology age will pass us by. So this is 
us using the existing device because the mobile phones of today they are powerful enough they are even more powerful than several some um, computers um, several years ago yeah so they are powerful enough to write codes and uh, thanks to the linux terminal because linux is the bottom line is linux linux is a very very mature operating system most of the servers on the internet that are cloud-based servers are based on linux so the knowledge you have will translate to the de to the desktop when you install the desktop um, Linux is translate to your server because to connect to my server to code on my server all I have to do is SSH into my server and I start coding on my server so the knowledge is transferable across several devices. These days mobile phones are like many computers providing many of the features a regular laptop offers and with many youth having access to smartphones much more than computers this may help solve the problem of young people learning to code at an early age. Researchers from Stanford University have developed a winged robot that mimics the way birds fly and could inspire the next generation of flying robots. The researchers looked how birds can dynamically alter the shape of their wings during flight, the motions of which are far superior to those of an aircraft. The pigeon bot, which features real bird feathers, was developed by Stanford University's bio-inspired research and design lab, led by David Lentink, a trained biologist and aerospace engineer. Rather than flapping, the pigeon bot's wings use a morphing technique like real bird wings, along with a propeller and tail like a conventional aircraft. Pigeon Bot features biohybrid morphine wings featuring real bird feathers elastically connected to a pair of robotic bird wings. The joints of the wings can be activated individually. Alright, so I have the uh, wrist joint programmed to this knob symmetrically, so wow. those will move together. The team flexed and extended the wings dynamically in a wind tunnel to see how the feathers responded to aerodynamic loading. They found that bird feathers contain tiny microstructures that form a one-way velcro type material that resists sliding in one direction. This is known as directional velcro. Directional velcro is formed when adjacent feathers slide apart during extension. Thousands of lobate cilia on the underlapping feathers lock with overlapping feathers to prevent gaps forming in the wing surface. Lentic discovered that this nature's own Velcro effect is exclusive to certain birds, including bald eagles, California condors, and the humble pigeon. Birds such as barn owls have wings where the feathers can separate, leaving a gap that is less than aerodynamic, whereas pigeon feathers include this latch hook system, keeping the feathers in place. The team hopes that the morphing ability of the pigeon bot could pave the way for certain more agile aircrafts and help share the future of drone design. Children with some of the most severe forms of autism are benefiting from cutting-edge technology, including virtual reality and data mining. Staff at Prior's Court, a specialist autism care facility in Berkshire, England, are using VR headsets to help children acclimatize to scenarios they are likely to encounter outside of school. People with autism may find unfamiliar situations stressful or anxiety-inducing. The VR scenarios introduce children to real-world situations like visiting a shopping mall or getting on an aircraft without leaving the comfort and safety of their classroom. It also gives them the chance to enjoy new experiences such as skiing or deep sea diving. Our young people, they have very difficulties with sensory issues so they can find it over overwhelming going for very busy places or transition to a new place so they like what is familiar, what is they like their routine. 
So this, the VR sets allow them to experience new realities and probably help them with transitions when they have to face a new place. Prior's court cares for around 95 young people at the severe end of the autism spectrum, including many who are non-verbal and are unable to communicate their needs. The charity is also hoping big data can help. They are trialing a new data collection system called Prior Insight that will gather a detailed picture of each young person's day, including what they've eaten, how much exercise they have had and how they are behaving. And that information looks at things like incidents, um, seizure activity, food and drink input, toiletry input, personal care, any activities they've done and any sleep data. We're hoping to not only increase our knowledge and awareness about the world of young, the world of young people with autism at Prize Court, but we're also hoping to be able to, in time, share that with the wider autism world. Diary entries are collected by staff and some of the children enjoy completing some of the 10,000 entries made every week. The system has already identified the spikes in 11-year-old Otto's behaviour before he suffers from an absence seizure which can last only a few seconds and are difficult to spot. Staff are now alerted by particular behavior and can be extra vigilant.